Hi, welcome to This Week in Medicine. Thanks for coming back. We'll review topics, highlights in medicine from this week. There was a lot that went on in COVID therapeutics. Here we go. Again, this is brought to you by the Foxhall Foundation, a 501c3 initiative that we started a couple of years ago. We're getting ready for a nutritionist, so keep an eye out. That will be coming soon, and we already have a yoga class enrolling. Hopefully, we'll develop some more classes soon uh, as we experience a decreased number of patients and, and people with COVID in our area. It's time for us to get out and get well. So what stressed us out this week? There's still some booster confusion. We'll talk about that in a minute. Air safety travel is still a concern. Halloween's coming, but it looks like in our area we'll, there will actually be trick-or-treating, safe trick-or-treating. So uh, Halloween's looking good for our area. The J&J &J second shot we keep getting told is going to be approved soon. I really do think it will be approved. And I think it's safe. The risk of um, blood clots in young women is probably what's holding this back. So hopefully that will be resolved soon. But I do think the J&J &J shot is coming. Uh, how do we interact with the unvaccinated is still a problem because people are trying to return back to normal lives. And so we need some rules of engagement with the unvaccinated, uh, which typically would be don't engage if you don't have to. Uh, vaccines for kids, a uh, vaccine for kids is definitely coming. So the data has been submitted to uh, FDA and hopefully they'll be deciding on the Pfizer vaccine soon. And then the question of when will this be over? It looks like it's getting closer, doesn't it? Because the numbers, at least in our area, are going down. The numbers worldwide have been going down, according to WHO. And in our hardest hit areas of the country where we have the most unvaccinated people, it's also starting to turn the corner. And one thing that did not stress me out this week is that we went to the Hillary Hahn concert at National Symphony Orchestra this weekend at the Kennedy Center, which was great. There was a vaccination policy, so we all had to show our vaccine cards. Um, it was a very uplifting experience. Uh, everybody looked very happy to be there. So no, that did not stress us out this week. That actually was a sign, a hopeful sign that we're turning the corner. Again, I wanna remind you the Delta infection and hospitalization rate the breakthrough rate for those who are vaccinated, look at that Moderna vaccine rate, 95% against hospitalization with Delta infection, Pfizer 80%, and at least in our area, a lot of people have already started to get their Pfizer booster shot. Um, you look at that 95% rate against hospitalization, you wonder, does Moderna really require a booster shot? Um, I think they, it will be approved soon. Uh, FDA is clearly uh, discussing the 50% dose, which would be half of the 100 ml dose, so 50 mls instead of 100. Um, and that is probably going to reach a decision point in the next week or two. J&J uh, &J booster shot, if we can get from 60% to 90, 96%, that will protect us against hospitalization. And then urgent care or ER use, um, if you get a Delta breakthrough infection, again, extremely good protection for all of the vaccines that we have. And quite frankly, all of those pretty much beat our typical influenza vaccination. So booster confusion, there really shouldn't be. Let's make it simple. Pfizer, yes. J&J, &J, not yet, but soon. And Moderna, that one maybe no or possibly in very limited scope because you can see those numbers. You see how good the Moderna booster is. I think it's possible that a Moderna 50% booster because the numbers are so good will be restricted to those who are immunocompromised or over 65. We'll see what happens. Um, Pfizer booster recommendations, again, don't mix your vaccines. If you were Pfizer, stay Pfizer, Moderna, your booster should be coming soon. You should get vaccinated if you're over 65. So it's not even a may, it's a recommendation that you really should do the booster. And if you have an underlying medical condition or if you're in a long-term care facility, if you want to and you work in a uh, at-risk setting, you could get vaccinated as well if you're in the right age criteria. The big news this week is COVID therapeutics, the red pill. Molnupiravir. Hopefully they'll have a different name than Molnupiravir. So uh, famously in the matrix, we were offered the red pill, which is Molnupiravir or the blue pill. So uh, there, I'm sure there will be a lot of memes focusing on the matrix red pill, which is Molnupiravir. Merck in combination with a company called Ridgeback Therapeutics submitted an emergency use authorization for a twice a day drug. This is very similar to Tamiflu for influenza. Um, you take it for five days, you take it twice a day. It's a ribonucleoside analog that prevents replication of COVID. So when the COVID virus uh, gives instructions to the next set of uh, cells to replicate, 
that's interrupted by this drug. The trial was stopped early when one side had eight deaths and the other had none. This was a very good trial. It was blinded. But as is the case with these trials, there were observers who watched the trial participants to make sure they could identify this kind of thing early because you don't want people to continue dying who aren't getting a drug that's working. So eight people died in the placebo group and no one died in the treatment group. The risk uh, category for inclusion in this study was if you had mild to moderate disease with at least one risk factor that you could get very sick if your disease progressed. So that could be obesity, could be diabetes. So that's how the patients were chosen. They also had symptoms already for five days, which is great because for a lot of diseases like shingles, you know you need to get on an antiviral medication early, but these people already had symptoms for five days. So that's a nice window of opportunity to use a medication. It was actually done in non-vaccinated people, which makes sense. This was not Delta breakthrough patients. These were people who had not been vaccinated against COVID. So the question is, would it help with the breakthrough cases? We don't know because it wasn't tested in that population, but we already know the breakthrough cases are pretty mild. So this will help the non-vaccinated people. Will unvaccinated people who don't want to get the vaccine refuse to get the vaccine based on the availability of malnupiravir? It's possible. There are patients who already don't get the flu shot. And they don't get the flu shot because they think they can take Tamiflu or they can take Zofluza. So is this a disincentive to people getting vaccinated? Because we know vaccination definitely helps prevent Delta variants and other variants from generating in the population. If you take Molnupiravir, is that going to prevent the next Delta mutation, the next mutated COVID virus? Probably not as well as vaccination. So the question is, is this always a good thing to have a pill to treat? It probably is where you can't get vaccinated or people are refusing vaccination in the third world, in the developing world. It probably will be a good thing to have this pill. There have already been applications uh, made for a lower cost formulation of this pill. So this pill could be used in places that can not afford a high cost antiviral drug. There are also tests going on for post-exposure prophylaxis. So if you are with somebody who got COVID, you could then take this pill and prevent yourself from getting uh, COVID. We already can do that with influenza as well. So you can take a preventive dose of Tamiflu so that you don't get influenza if you were with somebody. Pfizer and Roche are also working on the same kind of pill. So expect to hear more about the pill that can treat COVID. Here's the direct page citation from the Merck website on Molnupiravir. It reduced the risk of hospitalization or death. Of course, they're going to say by 50%, but the population study was pretty small for this study. So 50% reduction in death sounds great. But as we said, eight people died in the uh, placebo arm and no one died in the treatment arm. So again, 50% reduction. You can see the small print down here. They plan to seek e uh, emergency use authorization, the EUA, as soon as possible. I think it's already been submitted. There are more treatments for COVID in research trials this week. This is what this medication combination is called. It's a MAB, which means it's antibodies for treatment or prevention. This is Tixagevimab and Silgavivimab uh, by AstraZeneca. Uh, it's a one shot of two long acting monoclonal antibodies that reduce the risk of symptomatic COVID by 77% in unvaccinated. It does work against the Delta virus. It lasts as long as three months, but they have a new technology that makes this monoclonal antibody cocktail, we call these antibody cocktails, uh, last as long as 12 months. So the reason that this is important is there are patients, and we do have some, who have had three shots already, three Pfizer or three Moderna, and they've still not demonstrated an antibody response to vaccination because they are so immunocompromised. Uh, there are certain diseases that have failed to demonstrate a good antibody response, and there are certain chemotherapies that prevent a good antibody response. Um, so for those patients who have not demonstrated a good response, this cocktail could be a treatment that they could get um, if it is approved to help them not get COVID because they didn't generate an antibody response to vaccination. So this is very encouraging news. Regencov uh, research came out this week as well, September 29th, New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this was another MAB. Again, remember we said MAB, M-A-B stands for antibody, and we call these cocktails. So this was a trial of Regencov. It's a combination of monoclonal antibodies, 
casirivimab, imdevimab, uh, which reduces the viral load and number of medical visits. It reduced hospitalization and death. Um, this cocktail was also mentioned to me uh, by researchers in an infectious disease as a possible treatment for patients who have not responded at all with antibody response to vaccination. So Regencove is another one. Uh, moving on from COVID, you're probably all sighing relief right now that we're moving on from COVID. Uh, I thought this was an interesting article this week. Uh, maybe some of you saw this. Linda Evangelista, who was a model, um, filed lawsuit against a company that does cool sculpting, uh, plastic surgery that caused her to grow fat instead of lose fat. This technique is supposed to cause you to uh, get fat melted with, with cool sculpting, but in a low percentage, I think it was 1% or less, it can actually cause fat cell hyperplasia, which basically means fat growth. So this was an article by a journalist, Debbie Waldman, author, journalist, um, and she said botched plastic surgery is the most tangible evidence for why aging naturally is a healthier option, not just physically, but emotionally. But the most important part, I think, about this article was the denying aging. Um, the technique of doing plastic surgery, uh, other things that we do physically to our outward appearance to deny aging, doesn't really deny aging. It denies the physical, visible uh, external signs that you're denying aging, but it's not doing anything for the inside. She quoted the serenity prayer in this article, wisdom and accepting what we can't change, but actually you can change aging. Um, obviously you can change with plastic surgery, but that's not where it's most important. What we advocate at the Foxhall Foundation is to change aging inside. We change on the inside and that's where it truly matters. And we actually can do that and that's where it's most important. It's kind of funny because in a twist on this quote that Jane Fonda said, which I think she was making the analogy that we should be reaching inside for change, what she really meant was the emotional side, um, your psychological side. And what I mean is literally inside your body. We want you to reach inside to your arteries, to your heart, to your lungs, to your kidneys, reach inside your body, not superficially, not to your wrinkled skin, your dyed hair, your athletic build, your thinness. Um, none of that will make you younger. None of that will prevent aging. But it's what we do inside our body that can prevent aging. And I've shown this slide before and you're probably sick of seeing it, but we'll show it again. This is an aging artery. It's a pipe, it has, um, plaque, let's say, if that was an artery. It's the blockage of that plaque that is the problem. That's an aging artery. So that's the inside of somebody whose arteries have been allowed to age. And as we've told you before, it's clearly discussed in our book and some of our other talks, you don't have to accept that aging. So what's special about women in vascular disease in particular, and I'm talking about women because I took this slide from a talk I did on women's health. This is Susan Lucci, and she's celebrating uh, women's heart disease. So celebrating it because she herself was saved by the interventions in cardiovascular uh, medicine by getting uh, stents and angioplasty for her coronary artery disease. So if we go back, that's probably what her arteries look like because she had plaque in her arteries. So even though she looks beautiful, clearly she has worked on her external appearance inside she had aged and her external appearance as lovely as she is did not save what was happening on the inside of her which was aging arteries and not really good looking plaque so again on at least the aging of your arteries uh, as you go through menopause your ldl cholesterol can definitely go up and i've been telling a lot of people this recently as we do our 50 and 60 year old physicals so your ldl cholesterol will bump up after menopause you have to look at your HDL cholesterol mostly because it will predict how aggressive your plaque growth may be. It doesn't necessarily protect you. We have a lot of patients who have elevated HDL cholesterol, so the good cholesterol that's even over 100, but they still have plaque. Uh, women can have abrupt changes also in the stiffness of their arteries. You need that abrupt change if you're increasing your blood volume by one and a half times because you're pregnant. So vascular changes are important so that you can get through pregnancy. But then the stiffness of your arteries as you get older becomes a problem because that inflexibility of your arteries changes your blood pressure and changes how your blood vessels react to stress and age. Uh, lipoprotein A is a great genetic risk factor that we probably need to be looking for more. Lipoprotein A causes rapid plaque development. 
faster than we would expect. It's just an easy blood test and it's also very strong in families. So if you have a mother who's 80 years old who suddenly has arteries full of plaque and needs a carotid surgery, maybe everybody should check to make sure they don't have lipoprotein A because that's a little bit too much plaque too fast, especially in non-smokers. Uh, estrogen doesn't decrease vascular disease risk, it's maybe it will increase it. So even though a lot of people might take estrogen because they think it's going to keep them younger or has the advantage of youth, it probably doesn't. This is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Knowing it exists is not enough. This is my favorite slide on breast cancer awareness because yeah, we're aware it's October, but what does that mean? That means think about when you had your last mammogram. They are safe enough to do every year. With 3D technology, the radiation dose is low. You get more radiation when you're on an airplane flight transcontinental than getting a mammogram. So yes, we know breast cancer exists, and this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but that means check and see when the last time was that you had your mammogram. Tony's tip of the week, why don't you think about trying a Canadian pharmacy? If your new drug is really expensive, or if it's what we call it uh, out of your formulary, or we have to do a tier exception and that doesn't work, if your drug is just not covered, think about using one of these pharmacies. Um, this has been in the news since uh, the last president was in office because he directed um, go our government, FDA, to make it easier to get drugs from Canada and the United States. You can already do that. The idea as far as a governmental uh, movement would be to allow states to import big quantities of Canadian drugs so that the states had the authority to get these drugs. But right now, even U.S. citizens can get them legitimately. Northwest Pharmacy, Canadian King Pharmacy, Canadian Pharmacy World, there are many of them. I have many patients who use Canadian Pharmacy. All you need is a prescription. Typically, uh, we write you the prescription. You can uh, fax it or mail it to the company. And for probably 50% less price, especially on the name brand drugs, you can get a cheaper version of what your plan might not cover or what is too expensive through your plan. Um, it takes a little longer because they are getting these drugs from around the world. So they're not coming manufactured in Canada. Canada is sourcing these drugs from all over the world. Uh, but many times they are name brand drugs and many times it's a lot less expensive. So if you want us to do this for you, we can hand write out the prescription. You can go online to the website, type in the name of the medication. It'll bring up uh, if it's generic or trade name and what the cost would be for a 90 day supply of that drug. If you want to do that, just get a prescription from us. You can uh, fax it into them, mail it to them, scan email it to the Canadian drugstore and then you'll get your drugs. Fast pitch, of course, October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Get your mammogram. Um, if you can't get in for a physical because the system's quite overloaded right now, you could at least get your blood work. I had one patient who did his blood work. He didn't have time to get in for a physical, but that blood work saved his life because it revealed that he had cancer and he's doing fine today. So he didn't get in for his physical, but certainly his blood work was very important. Again, don't trust your pharmacy uh, with refill requests. If you haven't gotten your refill done, if the pharmacy is saying that they don't have it, just send us an email or call us because we can track this down. Um, computers are only so good. It's okay to get your flu shot now. We have flu shots in the office. If you want to come to the office and get a flu shot, we can do that and you can get your Pfizer booster at the same time. So again, remember, research studies show that the flu vaccine is most effective for 100 days. After 100 days, its efficacy declines, and we know that influenza starts in this area in January and February, so just count back 100 days, and you'll find out when it would be a good time to get your flu shot. Now is fine. I personally try to get mine in November because I want the longest duration of efficacy. Again, uh, the foundation of health, our pyramid, We'll go through this, uh, another section of it, in another talk. Uh, again, if you have some ideas about any of this, certainly let me know. And remember, you can share this with your friends who have not done it, and I'm sure that is not many of you. Make sure you get your shot. Get that COVID vaccine, get your flu shot, because the one thing that can upset the entire pyramid is if you miss a vaccination. And that's it for this week. Thank you again.